Um, well, I started um, back in the late 1980s doing my own material, writing and drawing, uh, usually sarcastic tales of, um, uh, on, about celebrities and kind of uh, the social situation in the UK at the time. And I also worked with my brother, and we collaborated and we kind of um, uh, became quite successful in a kind of small scale, but then I had worked through DC Comics. Um, but I've always been uh, motivated to write my own material. My most recent graphic novels are collaborations with other writers. Um, I think they were maybe two of my most favourite to work on recently. Uh, one called Life Sucks. It's about a um, depressed teenage vampire. So the kind of comedy aspect of it is like, he doesn't like to kill people, he's just uh, he's drinking kind of blood from blood banks and he's like, uh, he's a kind of vegetarian vampire really. And Dean Cook Negro is a recent um, uh, thriller I worked on with a writer called Matt Johnson, who's an African American writer. Um, her, he wrote, decided to write a story um, about uh, mixed racial identity in a kind of a thriller context based on uh, the true story of an African-American journalist in the 1920s and 30s called Walter White, who went undercover um, to report about um, racist lynchings in deep south uh, southern states in America. When I first started working, there was an a, a emergence of uh, new graphic novels, um, in particular uh, The Dark Knight by um, Frank Miller and Watchmen by Alan Moore and uh, David Gibbons, and um, they gave a new sophistication to comics in the graphic novel form. And also Mouse by Art Spiegelman, uh, a kind of um, uh, graphic history, a kind of uh, biography of his father, um, tackling the issues of the um, Holocaust in the Second World War. So comics were tackling subjects that weren't just for kids, and they were like, um, more interesting and more sophisticated, and especially visually more uh, interesting. And, um, I'm just going to show you some of um, the way that I work to create this story. On the left we have the script. On the script I always draw a thumbnail, it's like a small kind of like version of the comic strip. So I can decide um, how I'm going to draw each picture when I come to draw it. And on the right you see the pencil version of the page. What I try to convey is the sense of the scale of the monster. Here's the final stages of the so when you're doing a comic or a graphic novel, one of the things that you have to do is basically um, lots of character sketches to get the characters right. Because if you look at any graphic novel, there, there's about 100 pages or more. Before you even start the first page, you need to get the characters perfect. Because I'm very inspired by films and film noir, um, old films, new films. Um, so in my comics, I kind of incorporate uh, some of the techniques like zooming, close-ups, panning, and I'm very, because a lot of the work I do is in black and white, I love black and white films, so I kind of try to use a lot of dark blacks and kind of contrasting colours. It's an example of what I'm saying about um, film, film techniques, uh, and also a visual way of um, telling the story um, without words sometimes. Sometimes the, the message can come across even more powerfully when you these words. This story was inspired by a train journey and, and it's all about um, a kind of old man who is thinking about thinking back about his life and how he could have changed it. These are, this is a double page spread from a, a famous British artist called Raymond Briggs. I've included this example because it's a really nice way of um, telling a story over a, a kind of like period of time in, in a completely visual way. And all without the use of words, so it's like it's almost a universally understood kind of um, what's happening. Um, slightly different, this is um, uh, from The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen by Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill. Um, but it tells a kind of famous story um, of Sherlock Holmes. So it's a really uh, kind of dynamic, kind of um, visual way of telling that particular story of a fight scene and kind of the fight between. Holmes and Moriarty and the sudden fall. You see how he's used a really large panel to kind of give a sense that he's um, he's falling to his death. What a lot of artists do, and writers and artists, artist writers, is that um, they uh, often 
we'll kind of make sure that uh, one particular scene finishes on a page. It's a, a kind of way of heightening the dramatic tension, and then when you turn the page, you're in a new scene. Uh, this is by an artist called James Stern. This is all about uh, a Jewish baseball team in uh, America in the 1920s. And what I like about this is like um, he's yeah, there's a passage, passage of time, but there's also the kind of building of drama through this scene. So we get to the last panel, and he actually hits the ball, and that kind of leads to the next page. Um, this is some of my own work uh, from the book Incognito I was talking about earlier. I chose this because it kind of shows up uh, the style that I use a lot, um, influenced by old films of black and white. So I'm using close-ups and also kind of like a looking over the, um, the shoulder of the sheriff um, it's almost like where the camera or where the person we could be the kind of person after him if you see him. kind of using similar techniques to how alfred hitchcock would make a film and you see here i've um where this actual scene kind of finishes uh, it's like a kind of end of a paragraph and the next page is the start of another paragraph also the kind of passage of time thing i was talking about the i've basically kept the same viewpoint but the, the thing that um, the reader is thinking is like will he use the gun or won't he so it's like the tension between the two characters is maintained and probably strengthened by the choice of keeping the same angle rather than changing the angles um, this is some work from one of my favorite uh, comic artists um, maybe uh, Hernandez in uh, kind of American uh, Mexican um, artists, similar use of black and white and cinematic techniques to, to what I use as well. Um, this is a page by an artist called Seth uh, uh, from a book called Pelucavu. Um, I've included this because it's another example of using the visual to, to tell a narrative without words. It's an example of how the surreal can be used in comics to create mood and atmosphere. Um, and it's another kind of uh, interesting example by an um, American artist called Chris Ware. He uh, kind of mixes up kind of panels and panel sizes in a kind of like, slightly unusual way that aren't like traditional comics. Um, this is a story I did called The Shipping Forecast for my book, Montague Terrace. Um, in Britain, we have a thing on the radio called The Shipping Forecast. And there's something about it that's almost poetic. Um, each area uh, around Britain has kind of a particular name, and the names are quite unusual and strange. And when it's read out on the radio, it has a kind of a sense of the poetic. What I tried to do with this story was to start with an image, but then kind of change your perception of what was happening. So the first page we see the ship, and we're hearing the weather forecast. And on the next page, we see that the ship is actually a ship in a bottle, and kind of like pulling away, we see more things from. Uh, this person's life, the kind of memorabilia, the kind of effects of someone who used to be a sailor. So while the forecast is going on in the background, which we can see, um, we're going up these kind of dark, mysterious stairs, so we don't know to, to where. And eventually we come to the top of the staircase on top of the building, you can see the rain coming down the steps. And as we get to the top of the house, we see a figure kind of turning our ship's wheel. But then as we pull away, we see that he's kind of on, this, on top of the building, and uh, the kind of... Uh, the storm is like, is almost something that's in his mind. When I work with other writers, then everything is kind of uh, usually broken down into a page. It's much like a film script. So you have page one, page two, page three. Each kind of uh, panel or frame is numbered. So on page one, we have panel one, panel two, panel three. Um, page one, panel one, two. Okay, and here you have what's happening, and then you have the dialogue, and the same for these. But then it's up to me to interpret, interpret it into a visual way. So like, say, uh, an establishing scene or something, like a city or something. This could be a close-up of someone's face. And then you could have that person looking up at the building okay. and other people talking or something like that. So, so it's like a, the, basically with the script, the, the bare information is there for me. Uh, it's up to me to kind of uh, interpret that script in, into the best way for the person to read it.
Usually I like to have the whole story ready, so kind of written or scribbled out or with ideas. Um, I think sometimes it might be nice to actually just start something, not knowing where it's going to finish, like some writers do that. Um, yeah, I do. Um, I also think um, in these days where more and more stuff is being published on the internet, that we should be able to use both of them. Um, maybe the internet can help publicize the, um, the work so that when it's kind of a uh, series is finished, people can then buy the book. Uh, from experience I've noticed that um, just because something is on the internet doesn't mean that people don't actually want to read it. I think people love having books and love opening books and reading them. There's having holding in their hands. So I see that.